The First Blood B67 is a keyboard I'm extremely excited to share with you. I ordered mine on Kickstarter around the same time as I ordered my Mel Geek Mojo 84, just because I liked the look of it and it was one of the few keyboards from well-known manufacturers on Kickstarter at that time. The Epo Maker First Blood B67 is available to pre-order now in four colorways, those being Pearl White, Obsidian Black, peach pink and crystal clear. The price is $179 compared to the $159 super early price on Kickstarter when it was available on there. I had no expectations really, I'm not really that clear even after some research online where Epo Maker ends and Akko begins. There are Akko keyboards for sale on the Epo Maker website, keyboards called Akko Epo Maker on Amazon and Akko switches in Epo Maker keyboards so it's hard to know who makes what. I mention this as I've got the Akko 3084 sign on the shelf from early on in my keyboard days and it looks and feels like junk now that I've got other budget keyboards like the Keycon V series in my collection now which are so much better so I think perhaps this association between Akko and Epo Maker put me off Epo Maker keyboards to some degree it actually looks now like some of the Akko keyboards like the ACR Pro series might be pretty decent I'll be getting an Akko ACR Pro sometime soon anyway so keep an eye out for that anyway I digress this is an Epo Maker keyboard and it is leaps and bounds better than and totally different to the Akko I have already on the shelf. Unboxing was pretty standard, unusually it was sent in the post with just a plastic bag over the keyboard box. Most keyboards I order come with either a cardboard box over the keyboard box or bubble wrap over the actual keyboard box which means the keyboard box itself is usually pristine in case you do want to resell. On the one hand I prefer less packaging being used, on the other hand this box is now much worse for wear than the other keyboards that come double boxed. It's no issue from a keyboard damage point of view as the keyboard box itself was well packed inside with plastic and foam packing materials. In the box you'll find the keyboard in a bag with a plastic dust cover on top, a couple of stickers, the manual, the Mac keycaps, a keycap puller which should be a keycap and switch puller given this is hot swappable, and a 1.8 long USB-A to USB-C rubber cable with a coiled section. The box basically had everything you need and nothing more. I have no issue with there being not too much in the box as I like to see it when single use plastic isn't overused. So let's take a look at some of the specifications and features of this keyboard. It has a solid acrylic smoky case and weighs in at a reasonably hefty 1135 grams. It is what Epo Maker call an aesthetic acrylic full body design which I take to be in reference to the fact that it looks like it's been CNC'd out of a single chunk of plastic with the screws holding together the top and bottom case being very well hidden. The layout is 67% with 67 keys, hence the B67. The obsidian black version I have comes with smoky transparent polycarbonate keycaps to match the case. The crystal comes with the same only clear transparent and the other two versions come with PBT hot sublimation keycaps. My keyboard came with the very nice Kale MX Jellyfish switches, the non-box version, which it appears all the versions come with without a selection to choose from. Although on one of the pages on the Epo Maker website, it does reference some customised Epo Maker Flamingo switches. I don't really know what that's in reference to. It's a gasket mount design. It has a hot swappable south facing RGB PCB, which also features their proprietary double sided RGB. It has tri-mode connect, type C wired, 2.4 gigahertz wired, wireless and Bluetooth 5.0 with connection and switching between up to four devices. It is Windows and Mac compatible with Mac switches included in the box. You just need to use function, a plus A and S key combinations to switch between Windows and Mac OS. It has a whopping 3750 milliamp hour battery which will be responsible for a good chunk of the keyboard's weight and is pretty much a must have for a keyboard with this kind of lighting. So let's tear this thing down. I wasn't actually planning to take this apart as I'm not sure I want to do the PE foam mod on this one with the RGB being so good and such a feature of the keyboard but I may do is I'm finding the highest setting on the RGB to be too bright anyway. I'll just take it apart to look at the mounting system, build quality and see if I want to do any mods. So it's really easy to take apart most gasket mounted keyboards as the top and bottom cases are usually just screwed together to sandwich the gasket system in place. Keycaps off, switches out, stabilizers out apart from the space bar as it's blocked in by the plate mat which is always a trade off because it's good to have the dampening in there but it's also a bummer to have to disassemble the plate and PCB to get it out for modding. The six case screws are really easy to get to, you don't need to take all the keycaps off and switches out like I have, it depends on the reason for your disassembly of the keyboard, you only actually need to take a few keycaps off and a few switches out to get at the screws. With the six screws out you just lift off the top case. Next we lift out the plate and PCB assembly 
and I was happy to once again find the switch and USB-C port on its own mini PCB. This means you can take the main PCB out while leaving the switch and USB port where it is. You just have one extra socket to unplug. From here I could see the battery is housed in a heavy rubber tray with a thin layer of foam inside to eliminate any battery rattle whatsoever. This battery tray is a really nice and clever touch as it both eliminates battery movement and rattle but also looks really clean when looking into the case from underneath when the keyboard is still assembled. Next we take the plate screws out from the back of the PCB to get them apart. This allows you to lift the plate and dampening mat off the PCB and separate the three out. With those apart I can take out the spacebar stabilizer and that's the keyboard stripped down as far as is needed to do all the mods you like. So let's look at the component parts starting from top to bottom. First we have the top case. You can see that the six small tabs that the six screws pass down through are sticking out from the case. This conceals the screws and allows them to pass down through into the bottom case while creating this clean bezel of frame around the outside of the keyboard when it's assembled. Next we have the polycarbonate plate. On the top of the plate there are 10 silicone top gaskets. These are nowhere near as thick as the bottom gaskets but serve their purpose in preventing the PCB and plate assembly from topping out harshly and without any form of dampening. One thing to note is that the screws holding the PCB and plate together screw into this polycarbonate plate so you wouldn't want to be tearing this thing down too many times and you need to go carefully when screwing the plate and PCB back together because it is self-tapping screws into quite a soft plastic. Next we have what we would usually call the plate dampening pad but which Epo Maker have called the silicone sandwich. This isn't only a dampening mat but also has the 10 bottom gaskets connected to the outside. The gaskets are kind of this rib design as the silicone is quite hard and this softens the gasket feel considerably. The silicone sandwich is probably the most awkward part of the rebuild and one you need to make sure you get right as the mat is not just a flat mat but it has a lip all the way around to completely surround the PCB with silicone. You need to make sure that this lip is on the outside all the way around and not pinched between the plate and PCB. Next we have the PCB itself, all fairly standard but I will point out two things. This is one of the nicest and easiest plate and PCB combos I've seen in terms of easy insertion and removal of switches but also in terms of full and solid engagement of the clips on the switches under the plate and also I love the colorway very retro and it totally fits the vibe and feel of the keyboard even matching the color of the legends next we have the battery tray and battery like I said before it's a great idea in terms of securing the battery and concealing it when looking at it from underneath when the keyboard is assembled then we have the bottom case lovely and clean with the stickers underneath especially the one in the center with the aluminium logo on it you can see the feet are big and plush and add to that plush gasket mount feel of the keyboard that neat little switch and USB-C PCB there is an awesome touch which helps with disassembly and a nice little 2.4 gigahertz wireless receiver which is a press fit into its housing, it's not magnetic. You can see here that the stabilizers are heavily pre-lubed in both the stem and where the wire clips into the housing, these being the locations where stab rattle is an issue. There is no lube between the stem and the housing which is pretty much always the case with pre-lube stabs so a gain to be made there. The switches have a real light splattering of pre-lube on the stem rails and the housings are nice and tight so you shouldn't need films but I'll test that later. And that's it on disassembly and a look at the parts, all pretty nice quality, coming together to make a really nice and unique looking keyboard. So at that point let's do a stock typing test before I go on to explain my plan mods and my first impressions of the keyboard after a week or so of use. So that brings me on to my opinion and first impressions of the keyboard. When first seeing and laying hands on this keyboard it made me feel more excited than any other keyboard I've owned yet. It triggers some kind of retro memory in me that I can't quite put my finger on, brings out a real sense of I finally found it even though I didn't know I was looking for it. I think this is in some part because of the colourway, the yellow lettering and this particular colour frosted plastic reminds me of the old record players and some of the sound systems from my youth. It's also very much because of how amazing the keyboard looks and feels. When I really wasn't 
wasn't expecting it to be anything special and not really looking past the Mel Geek Mojo 84 which I got on Kickstarter at the same time with the same kind of timeline. The aesthetic of this keyboard is just incredible. It's all simple retro styling from above and it's all techy bling from below. Picking it up and looking at it from underneath is like some kind of smoky digital fish tank which I can't stop flipping it over to look in. It stands up off the desk with real presence, like the centerpiece that it is, it really has authority over the rest of the desk. The height is also great for me in terms of typing given there is no height adjustment and will also allow you to use pretty much any wrist rest you want to because there's plenty of height there. The RGB is just out of this world, whether you're looking down on it from the top or you flip it over to look underneath, it just looks amazing. Also, and it seems like a small one, but I really like it when the caps lock LED lights up for caps lock on. It's surprising how often this isn't done when it seems like such an obvious addition to make. The stock typing experience is almost at the same level as the Mel Geek Mojo 68 and 84, and the acrylic keycaps give this an even more unique typing feel than those excellent keyboards. The gasket mount system works really well. It has a fairly long feeling travel that starts off feeling really soft, and those massive feet under the keyboard only emphasize the gasket mount feel. It feels really different, not in a good or bad way, to the Mel Geek Mojo 84, which has a firmer feeling gasket system. As with all things, I do have a few points that I'm not too keen on. The RGB keycaps and switches that showcase the RGB are great, but at full brightness in lots of modes you can't see the legends, especially at night. All as you can see is the MX keycap stem crossed through the keycap, which completely obscures the legends. This is fine in the daylight and when touch typing in general, but if you're like me and you need to glance down once in a while for a function key or to get your bearings, then it's not great at night time when you have the RGB rocking. The other gripe is the keycaps being acrylic, which is the opposite to what I said earlier on I know. They look and feel ace, but my god do they get dirty. You can see every speck of dust and grime, and canned air doesn't cut it as the acrylic is kind of sticky. To keep these properly clean they'll need to come out from time to time, or you'll need to get one of those sticky blob things to roll around in there. All in all, I would say the aesthetic is the strongest point for me, but the typing experience in the stock configuration is not far behind. I'd give it an 8 out of 10 on the stock typing sound and feel, with the Melgeek Mojo 084 for comparison being a 9 out of 10. This is a really nice keyboard, a really refreshingly original and high quality keyboard from Epo Maker that I'd highly recommend to anyone.